Just going to go right on into my message this morning. I want to direct your attention to Proverbs chapter 14. Chaver, Proverbs chapter 14. My subject, America and our godly heritage. America and our godly heritage. Look at Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The Bible says happy is that people whose God is the Lord. The Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, I hope to answer that question today. What can we do? What can the righteous do if the foundations are being destroyed? Someone asked me years ago, what can we do? And so I intend to answer that today. But our four fathers and our founding fathers, knowing that certain truths are self-evident, are just plain old common sense. Our forefathers incorporated certain things into our Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence states, and I quote something here, we hold these truths to be self-evident, just common sense, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, end of quote. Our founding fathers recognized God as the creator and that all men were created by God and they're created equal. They recognized that all men have certain unalienable rights, and those rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In this good old United States of America, no baby should ever be aborted and killed through legalized abortion because every person, every fetus, every person that's ever been conceived has a right to life in the United States of America. They have a right to liberty. You're, you have certain rights that cannot be taken from you because the Constitution of the United States of America guarantees certain rights rights and liberties and it also guarantees you that in america you have the right to the pursuit of happiness an unalienable right is a right that it is impossible to take away now i'm going to say that again because look at how our rights are being stripped away an unalienable right is a right that is impossible it is impossible impossible to take that away so this nation began with an assertion of God's authority. And our first principle is that we are all created equal with unalienable rights, and God is our creator. My subject this morning, America and our godly foundation. I don't want people to forget our foundational values when the history books are being rewritten. I want us to know our roots, where we came from, who we are, and what this nation was established upon, I want to talk about America and our godly foundations. Let us pray. Father, your word says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, Lord, we can call upon you. Lord, we can pray that you will help us, and that's what we're doing today. God, our we know we're in perilous times. We know that our nation is in trouble. And, Lord, we ask you for your mercy, for your amazing grace. Lord, we ask you for a prayer movement that will begin in the churches, that I'll not have to call prayer and fasting, that people will come up to me and say, Pastor, we need to pray. Pastor, our church needs to pray. Pastor, our nation is in trouble. Pastor, we have all types of problems. Pastor, we need to pray. And Father, I pray that other pastors throughout this nation will begin, just as our forefathers did, to call people to prayer and fasting, to seek the face of God. Lord, speak to our hearts today. Thank you for the anointing to preach the word of God. Save the lost, Lord. Let people see where they are. Let them see the signs of the time and the indicators, and that they need a Savior. And his name is Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray, and everybody said, Jesus' name, amen. See, America as a nation was founded upon religious principles and upon, really, upon Christian principles. 
The basis of our Bill of Rights comes from the Holy Bible. I'll say that again. The basis for our Bill of Rights comes from the Holy Bible. Psalms 33 and 12, look at that. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. God raised up this great nation. It was against odds that it could not happen, but it did happen because of the hand of God. It is righteousness that exalts a nation, and America was founded and established upon godly principles. Our forefathers recognized that a nation is no greater than its God. They also recognized that a nation is no greater than its people. Righteousness exalts a nation, and happy is that people whose God is the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this, this nation was founded upon, and I'm going to give you some quotes today to show you that it, that is exactly what happened, no matter what others try to tell you. So I ask you, what would our founding fathers do if they were living today? What would be the first order? Well, first of all, I believe that they would pray. Why do I believe that? Because at the formation of this great nation, that is exactly what they did. History proves that. Because when they were faced with impossible odds and enemy superiority, they prayed and they called God's people to prayer. They did exactly what I am doing right now. They prayed, they fasted, and they called people to prayer. Amen. History proves that. I don't expect our present leadership to do that today because they're more concerned about power, their paycheck, and political correctness. So don't expect that out of them. Amen. Expect that out of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because we are praying and we believe in God for a great move. And I'm praying that God will not only disturb my sleep, he will disturb your sleep to the place that you start praying more and more and more for our nation. Our nation is in trouble. That means that the generations coming after us, they are in trouble. That our little children, they won't know the difference in uh, a man and a woman getting married if we let them go into our public school and them teach the stuff they're teaching now, and a woman and a woman and a man and a man getting married. God, he who decides, that's what father means, he who decides, he decided a long time ago that marriage is between a man and a woman in the subject. Amen. I do not expect our current administration to do what I'm asking. There may be some of them, but not from the leadership down. But I do expect the church to rise up. I do expect the church to fast and pray. And I do expect them to seek the face of God. Our present political leaders have shown us what they're going to do. But as a Christian and as a minister of the gospel, I realize that they do not hold the keys to the future of America. God holds the keys, and God has given the church the keys of the kingdom of heaven and the authority to preach the gospel and establish righteousness in this nation. It belongs to me as a minister of the gospel and to you as a minister of the gospel. Did I call you a minister? Yes, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. You're to preach it in your home. You're to preach it in the marketplace. You're to preach it uh, at the place that you work. Amen. And you can do it because I, I did it for 30 years and I never got called on the carpet for doing it. One man told me, said, do you know that all you ever talk about when you're not working is Jesus? I said, do you know that all you ever talk about when you're not working is Carolina basketball and Carolina football? Do you know that everybody talks about something? I just choose to talk about Jesus. Somebody go on and praise him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. The church has the keys of the kingdom. Most of our leaders and our politicians, they don't believe that, but that does not move me one iota because the Bible says the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And it says that the righteous will stand up and if they will speak up, praise God, that God will move, revival will come, and this nation will be saved. Amen. God has given his church the keys of the kingdom of heaven, our future, the future of our nation depends on the church, not upon our educators, not upon our economists, not upon our politicians. 
God has given us the keys, and we have the keys to a national revival. Amen. Jesus said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. The church has been empowered by the Lord Jesus Christ, given authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. And it's time for the church to realize who she is and to rise up in great power and great anointing. Get on their knees and pray until the glory falls. Somebody go on and praise God. Hallelujah. Look at 2 Chronicles 1, uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. God said, if my people, talking about the church in the dispensation of grace that we live in, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. God knows America has sinned. We have left God at the place of fullness. We have turned our back on God many times, and, and, and God is calling us to return to him. He said, return unto me, and I will return unto you. He said that to the nation of Israel, and he's declaring that today through the prophetic voice that's coming out right now. Return unto me, God said, and I will return unto you. Some prophets, you know, they want to tell you your future, and that's part of prophecy. But in the world today, a prophet, he's not somebody that just comes up and said, God showed me that you're going to be this, and you're going to be that, and you're going to do this and do that, and they speak a soft word. That's a part of it. They are seals. They see the future. But you want to know what a real prophet is? Some of that stuff you hear, they not heard from God at all. That's their human spirit. A real prophet. Is a man of God that stands up with authority, and he proclaims, thus saith the Lord. That's what a prophetic voice is. And you're hearing the prophetic voice today because I'm telling you what thus saith the Lord. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. God bless the USA. Save us, O oh God, from our sin and raise us up to be a light to the world. Amen. Hallelujah. If we will pray, God will forgive our sin. God will heal our land. Listen to this article found in worldnetdaily.com. And I quote, on June the 12th, 1775, the Congressional the Continental Congress, rather, locked in deliberations, called for a day of public humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Wherein, they say, we offer up our joint supplications to the all-wise, omnipotent, and merciful disposer of all events. That's just a big way of saying, God, we're praying. These were some educated men that drew up our Constitution. They were really well-educated, and you listen to how they talk as I continue. <laughs> so in compliance with this day of prayer and fasting, Congress attended an Anglican service, church service in the morning, and a Presbyterian church service in the afternoon. That's what Congress did. M. Stanton Evans, in his great book, The Theme is Freedom, wrote elsewhere around the country, religious ceremonies in response to this appeal were many and reiterated. In other words, they all got together as a nation and started praying. And calling upon the name of God. Imagine what would happen if our Congress would follow the steps of our founders by calling upon God in the important affairs of this nation. Can you imagine? But instead of this, our representatives, they have stood idly by. They have allowed federal judges to impose laws that are contrary to our constitutional rights. They have passed laws under the guise of separation of church and state. The American Civil Liberties Union has sought for many years to, to, take, and to take everything about God out. They are anti-God. They are anti-Christ, and that is their agenda, and you need to know that. Look at what's going on in our nation. Our lawmakers have removed prayer from the public school system.
They have removed the Ten Commandments from the loans and the, the, the buildings of the courthouses. They have passed laws to kill little innocent babies through legalized abortion. May God have mercy upon us. They have sought and they have just redefined marriage. Amen. God had already defined marriage. Our forefathers recognized that and they understood what the Bible says because most of them were godly men and many of them were preachers of the gospel. A nation that began with an assertion of God's authority now mocks God and seeks to remove all reference to God from the public square. We are watching the moral disintegration of a nation right before our eyes. Turn on the news. You are watching the moral disintegration of a nation right before our eyes. You know, it's bad when uh, uh, people sin, but when a nation endorses sin, that's an abomination. That's really bad. And that's what our lawmakers are doing. Our lawmakers have become lawbreakers. Amen. We can no longer trust the secular news media. We can no longer trust our lawmakers. We can no longer trust our elected officials. So what is the answer? Who can we trust? Church, the time has come that once again we must cry out to God in earnest prayer. We must put our complete hope and confidence for this nation in the hands of Almighty God. In God we trust. After all, who else can we trust? We must pray. We must fast. We must seek the face of God. We must realize that we have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. We are called. We are the ecclesiastes, the church, the chosen one. God said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Somebody go on and praise God for his amazing grace and his mercy that he has shown to this great nation. We must pray and we must seek the God of the Bible. Prayer moves the hand of God. And you can make a difference. I mean, you can make a huge difference because the Bible is not a book about a massive movement. No, the Bible is a book about individuals that prayed, that sought God, that were used by God. Men and women who single-handed in a lonely way at times stood up for small things just because it was right. Hallelujah. We need people like that. We need people that are real. I mean, I, we need preachers that are real. I, I preached a sermon on the real deal. I, I got one person that wanted a copy of it. Everybody ought to listen to it. Because Eli, he was soft on sin. He was God's prophet. He was called to be a prophet. He let his children, his sons, do things that were sinful. And God called him on the carpet and said, I'm taking the priesthood away from you. You've been too soft on sin. It was an everlasting covenant, Eli. I told your family you were going to have an everlasting covenant. But I'm taking the priesthood away from you because of your sin. So out of that came a prophecy, and it was fulfilled during the time of, of, of King David. And there were two priesthoods, Abiathar and Zadok. Abiathar, he was good for a season, but, you know, he gave himself over to power and prestige, and he sought to uh, uh, be a part of an insurrection when they rose up against King David. And Abiathar, he departed, and he got disqualified but Zadok, the true priest, he stayed with David. He wasn't looking position. He was God's man. God had put him there. He didn't answer to any man. He answered to God. We need some preachers like that today that don't answer to man. They answer to God. Go on and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Prayer moves the hand of God. You can make a difference. Amen. Jesus taught that we should be faithful in little things. If you're faithful with a penny, guess what? You'll be faithful with a million dollars. Amen. Hallelujah. See, the Bible is a book of ordinary people who do extraordinary things through the everlasting gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It is a book about ordinary people who through the supernatural power of God, they do extraordinary things because they've been touched by a nail-scarred hand. Their citizenship is in another world. And while they're here on this planet, they're in the world. They're not of the world. They're just here to make a difference. Hallelujah. If the Bible says it's right, then it's right. If the Bible says it's wrong, then it's wrong, 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 and it's just that simple. Amen. Our founding fathers understood that, and they cherished their relationship with God. Patrick Henry stated, and I quote, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religiousness, but by Christians. How about that? Not by religiousness, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We shall not fight alone. God presides over the destinies of nations. End of quote. Benjamin Franklin stated, and I quote, I have lived a long time, and the long I live, the more convincing proof I see this truth, that God governs the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is, is it possible that empires can rise without his aid? End of quote. Daniel Webster, who served as Secretary of State under three presidents, Harrison and Tyler and Fillmore, he stated this, and I quote, if the power of the gospel is not felt throughout the length and breadth of this land, listen closely, anarchy and misrule, degradation and misery, corruption and darkness will reign without mitigation or end. End of quote. Do you see where America is headed if the church does not rise up and pray? We, we don't have the voice in Congress. We don't have the voice at the Capitol anymore. We have a voice with God, and God controls the destiny of nations. In other words, if God's people do not remain committed to affecting our social and our political culture with the gospel, our nation will not last. We just will not last. Church, our nation is in trouble. And if we are to survive, we must pray and we must fast and we must return to the everlasting gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the church. When revival hits the church, guess what? The psalmist cried, God, will thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? I'm looking, praise God, I have church by myself sometimes, but I'm looking for the whole church to come in here shouting, glory, hallelujah. There's been a change in this life of mine since he laid, the Lord laid his hands on me. There's been a change in this life of mine since the Lord laid his hand on me. The things I used to do, I don't do no more. The place I used to go, I don't go no more. The way I used to talk, I don't talk no more. There's been a change in this life of mine because of the everlasting gospel. And the Lord laid his hand on me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, warned, and I quote, If we will not be governed by God, we must be governed by tyrants. End of quote. Nor Webster stated, I quote, In my view, the Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. The Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people, end of quote. Church, like our founding fathers, we must become more actively involved in the affairs of our government. That will help some, but that, that, that is not the key to our nation's survival. We've gone too far for that. We, we have lost our spiritual equilibrium. But the key is this. Prayer moves the hand of God. And we must actively engage in prayer if we are to survive as a nation.
Prayer moves the hand of God. People say, you can't move the hand of God. Well, I can tell you what, I can write a book on how many times I pray. Can't you? And how God has moved in your family, how God has moved in your life, how God has moved in your home, how God has moved in your finances, how God has just blessed you going and blessed you coming and blessed everything you put your hands on. I'm not saying there are not some hard times. I'm not saying there's not a fight. It's called a good fight of faith. So suit up. Put on the whole armor of God and start praying in the Holy Ghost with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance for all saints. And the glory of God, will streak of God's glory, will hit this earth once again. And it's going to start in the church. I prophesy to you that you're going to see preachers that, that are not living right. You're going to see them having to turn their credentials in because they're going to be called on the carpet for the gross sin in their life. I prophesy that to you. God said, judgment shall begin at the house of the Lord. I prophesy to you that some of you that are living in sin out there and in here, that your life is going to be exposed. The sin will be exposed. Why? Because God said judgment shall begin at the house of the Lord. I prophesy that there is a great uh, awakening coming to this nation. I prophesy that there are souls that are coming into the kingdom. I prophesy that we're in the last days and the former rain and the latter rain is going to be poured out by God. And if God's people in the United States of America will pray God, God will forgive our sin. He will heal our land and show up in great power. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. Our nation has sown to the wind, and we're reaping a whirlwind. Without a move of God, this nation will perish. We need a revival in prayer. We need a revival of prayer in the church, and we need a spiritual awakening in this nation. And they come in that order, prayer and revival. I said they come in that order, prayer and revival. If my people, which are called, put Second Chronicles 7, 14 up there. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. We have the keys, church. The Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, he has entrusted his authority to preach the gospel and to make a difference in our culture into the hands of his body, the church. Amen. He's the head, and we're the body. And guess what? The head doesn't do anything without the body, and the body can't do anything without the head. People say, I'm waiting on God. Well, quit waiting on God. Jesus already cut a new and a better covenant at Calvary. He gave the gospel into uh, young early, the early church preachers that come out of that, that little upper room that, where the five, the Holy Ghost had fallen preaching Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They looked like Jesus. They talked like Jesus. Everywhere they went, they were just talking Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The devil thought he had him made when he put Jesus up on that cross. But ten days later, uh, uh, after the day of Pentecost, rather, 40 days later, they came out of that little upper room there after Pentecost experience. It's a total of 50 days, I believe, Pentecost, amen. And they came out. Preaching Jesus. How did they preach Jesus? John said, in the beginning was the Word. Where it was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that, that was made. How, how did they preach Jesus? Paul said, if I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. How did they preach Jesus? Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. He has raised him. He has ascended. He has put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head of the church, which is his body. Hallelujah. And we have the keys where his body amen he said if you abide in me and my words abide in you you shall ask what you will it shall be done unto you no ifs but maybe buts if you abide in me my word abides in you and if you call upon me praise God I will answer from heaven I will heal your land my God 
Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. You know, Christianity is a way of life. It's not a religion. It is a way of life. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at Galatians 6 and 7. The Bible says, Be not to see, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Look at verse 8. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Amen. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. See, the Bible calls black, black, and white, white. And there is no gray in the middle. You are either for God or you are against God. You are either righteous or you are unrighteous. You are either saved or you are either lost. You are either on your way to heaven or you are on your way to hell. You cannot serve two masters. And the Bible warns us, if we live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, the flesh, you shall live. A person who persists in sin, a person who practices sin, they are the servant of sin. They are not the servant of God, no matter what they say with their mouth. God says, "My, I look upon the heart. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And guess what? The same conditions that are laid down for your salvation, those same conditions, they have something to do with your continued salvation. Our initial salvation was conditioned upon repentance. So if you do sin, you have an advocate, repent. Amen. Our continued salvation is conditioned upon our obedience. It is better to obey than to sow wrong seed. And end up with your life torn all to pieces. The wages of sin is death. Sin will kill you. It will kill your influence. It will kill your body. It will kill your marriage. It will kill your finances. It will kill your home. Sin will kill you and send you to a devil's hell. That's a way out of sin. The wages of sin is death. But, hallelujah, the gift of God is eternal life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. If a person practices sin, that person's life will become corrupt. If a nation practices sin, that nation will become corrupt. America must return to the true gospel if we are to survive as a nation. Look at this point number one. The gospel teaches a reverence for God. The gospel teaches a reverence for God. God is holy, and God is sovereign. God is a holy God, an all-powerful God, and He can do anything, anytime He wants to. He is sovereign. He holds the future in His hands. Look at this. Proverbs 9 and 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. I'm trying to give you some understanding this morning. We've got a bunch of slick tongue preachers that tell you a lot of stuff, but they won't preach about sin and what it'll do. It'll destroy your life. It'll destroy a nation. It's a terrible, ugly thing. It has pleasure for a season, but in the end it bites like a serpent and like an adder because that's what sin is come from the snake, from the pits. God is wisdom. Knowledge of God's holiness is understanding. And God is to be respected, and God is to be reverenced. Look at Proverbs 16, 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. By the fear of the Lord, I reverence you. I also fear you because you're a sovereign God. See, I'm not afraid of God. The reason is because God is sovereign. I'm God's child. Because God is sovereign, because I'm God's child, everything's going to be all right. 
Amen. It, it, God is sovereign. If you're God's child, you don't have anything to fear because everything's going to be all right. But if you're living in sin, you have something to fear because nothing is really going to be all right. And I need to say this to somebody. I don't know who I'm talking to. But zoom in on me, Brother Baker. If you cannot control your sexual passions, you can never walk in authority in any other area of your life. If you cannot control your sexual passions, you will never walk in authority in any other area in your life. That is a sin of the body is worse than all sins. You need to learn to control your sexual appetites. And if you are not married and you need to get married, the Bible says it's better to marry than to burn in your lust. Okay? All right. Proverbs 16, 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Beware of any gospel that excuses sin and endorses compromise and softly whispers like some slick-tongued politician, everything is well. If you're living in sin, let me tell you something. The wages of sin is death, and everything is not well can you sing it is well it is well with my soul do you know that your heart doesn't condemn you when you stand before god's grace in his altar can, can you go to god and say god I, I have lived the best i know and when i messed up i've asked you to wash me in the blood and forgive me do you have confidence in your heart toward god if you do then everything is all right you can sing that old song it is well, it is well with my soul. Hallelujah. Beware of any gospel that excuses sin. Number two, any gospel that does not advocate holiness is no gospel at all. Jesus said, the pure in heart shall see God. Hebrews 12, 14 it says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I made some strong statements. But there's the Bible for it. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness or the sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. By the way, you that have been saved recently, I, I urge you to keep coming back to church. There's a second definite work of grace. It's called sanctification. Nothing is ever born clean. When you got born again, there were problems. A cow's not born clean. A baby's not born clean. A soul is not born clean. Nothing is ever born clean. You get born again, and you got stuff that needs to be washed in the blood and the washing of the water of the word. It's called sanctification. And then God has the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in tongue. There are all kind of gifts and all kind of prayers that you can pray, and God will give you wisdom and understanding. He gave the Holy Ghost, Jesus did, to the church. He sent him. He said, when he has come, he will teach you, he will lead you, he will guide you, he will empower you. We need to get so full of God that we lose sight of this world and everything around us. Hallelujah. Amen. Any gospel that does not advocate holiness is no gospel at all. God expects us to live a clean, pure, holy life. In our eternal destiny, it is bound up in a little two-letter word, if. That conditions to God's blessing. Listen to what Jesus said. If you continue, if. You continue in my word, then are you my disciples? Indeed. Jesus said, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withered, and men gather them and cast them into fire, and they are burned. You want a reference? Look at John 15, 6. It is either abide in Christ or burn in the fire. You must abide in Christ or you will burn in the fire. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If any man abide not in me, he is cast into the fire. A lot of ifs in here. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, if you will come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The Bible advocates holiness, and the Bible advocates obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Our nation needs to understand this. That righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. Look at this. Romans eleven twenty one. Paul warns us. If God spared not the natural branches, he's talking about the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. If God spared not the natural branches, branches take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Verse 22, Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. Look at this, 2 Peter 2 and 4. Peter warns us, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrowing, making them an example unto those who after should live ungodly. Now look at verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. What a sad commentary for someone who has known the amazing, saving grace of Jesus and then to go back on God and that they are going to be reserved unto a day of judgment and punishment. Over and over again, the Bible warns us about departing from the true and living God. Why are you on this, Pastor? Because that's what our nation has done. We have departed. We have lost our equilibrium. Can America expect anything less from God than judgment when we live the way we do now? Look at 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. I love this. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. See, our nation is in trouble. So, church, what must we do? Well, first of all, we must humble ourselves and pray. That's why, as your pastor, I am calling this church to 10 days of prayer and fasting. The church must awaken to her responsibility. We are the salt. We are the light. We are the conscience of our culture. We are the moral and the spiritual preservative. And God has chosen us to carry the gospel light into all the world around us. It's time we pray. Our foundational values such as Honesty, morality, liberty, life, and the pursuit of happiness, they are all under attack. We have become a permissive culture of political correctness and tolerance. Tolerance in our culture means nothing is absolute. Nothing is absolutely right or wrong. That's what the people would have you believe. But that's not God's way. God's plan of salvation has not changed. Amen. Salvation is available exclusively through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And as a nation, we have left our foundational values. Listen to this statement by John Quincy Adams. He was one of our early presidents of his nation. His daddy was actually the second president. He was the sixth president. He, he grew up during the time that the, he was a young boy at the time the Declaration of Independence was being drafted. But I, I quote him. Is it not that in the chain of human events, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior? That it is, forms a leading event in the progress of the gospel dispensation. This guy can talk, can't he? Is it not that the Declaration of Pen Independence first organized the social compact on the foundation of the Redeemer's mission upon the church, upon this earth? that it laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity. End of quote. I've done my homework. Amen. America was founded upon God's principles. 
Pastor Nick, and the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's how we were founded. God had principles in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we should never let anyone convince us otherwise. We are who we are as a people and as a nation by the grace of God. I close with this profound prayer. It was prayed by Pastor Joe Wright before the State House in Topeka, Kansas several years ago. Actually, I got a hold of him in 1995. It's been quite a while ago. But I want you to listen to his prayer. And I quote, Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good. But that is exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and inverted our values. We confess that. We have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and called it moral pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversions and called it alternative lifestyles. We have exploited the poor and called it lottery. We have neglected the needy and called it self-preservation. We have rewarded the lazy and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn and called it choice. We have shot abolitionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building esteem. We have abused power and called it political savvy. We have coveted our nation's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O oh God. Know our hearts today. Try us. See if there be any wicked way in us. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. We ask this, Father, in the name of your Son, the living Savior, Jesus Christ. End of quote. Let us stand. I want us all to come to this altar and pray. Let's make an altar for this nation. Come on to the altar and tell God to hear us, O oh Lord. Oh God, save us. Sing it. Hallelujah. I need you more. Oh Jesus. Lord, more than yesterday. We need you more, Lord, than we've ever needed you. you. Our nation is in trouble. Our little children, say, Lord, I need you more. They're going into a world than Lord, where our time on the values I need are being pushed Lord. aside. Oh God, if you don't send revival, you, this nation will perish. And God, if we don't pray, you cannot send revival because you condition the revival and the future of this nation or any nation upon the Word of God. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from that wicked way, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal that land. Oh, God, we're praying. We're praying, oh, God, for families. We're praying for little children. We're praying for a nation, oh, God, who has inverted her values. We're praying, oh, God, because you said, call upon me. I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty. Oh, God, I pray for the people that are gathered here today. Lord, if there's one soul, one soul that's not saved, I pray, God, you will touch them. Oh, God, let them know of your amazing love, that they will call upon you, that you're a merciful God. 
more. You love us with an everlasting love. Oh Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over this church, over these families, over this nation. I claim the blood. The blood, the blood, the blood. I need you, Lord. Oh, I need you. I need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. More than the For your people. We're the sheep of your pasture. More than the song All is I well see. with our soul, Lord. More than if the our sin is under the blood, but it's not well with this nation. Oh, oh God, have mercy upon and America. Lord, as time goes oh, God, by, have mercy I'll be by upon us your as a nation. I never love you, Lord want Jesus. To go back to my own life. Lord, I want to put a challenge before each family here. I'm putting it before me, and I want my wife to remind me. We need to pray each evening. We need to pray. We need to start an altar in our homes and make sure that every day we join together and we pray. We have the keys. We can change things, church, because our God, He can change things. It's Christianity is not about extraordinary people. It's about just ordinary people. People like me and people like you that have been touched by a nail-scarred hand that have been transformed. I need you, Lord. Sing it. Hallelujah. I need you more. Lord, we're going to pray. Holy Ghost, bring it to my remembrance. Do not let a day go by without my wife and myself. Lord, if we're in the presence of our children, let us always call the family to pray. God, give us, Lord, they used to call it a prayer burden. Give us a prayer burden for our nation, God. Lay it on our hearts, O Lord. Help us to pray. More than the Epis song the I see. God, there are people that are being weighed in the balance. There's a nation, oh God, More than being sifted and Lord, like wheat. Time goes by. Jesus, I believe just like you prayed for I'll Peter, you're praying for this side. nation because it was raised up I as a nation on the principles of the gospel. Lord Jesus, life. we come into prayer with you. Lord, the church, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, we make the Trinity of prayer. And Father, you answer prayers. Jesus, you ever live to intercede for the church. Holy Ghost, you pray through us with utterances. The supernatural utterances of God, the very perfect will of God. Help us, Lord, to be full of your Spirit. Full of grace, full of love, full of anointing. Help us, Lord. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Hey.